before I begin, um, I'm just going to tell you that one of the reasons I'm here today is my family would like to give you hope. And if I cry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have been where have you have been. I have sat where you've sat. And I've been on both sides. I've been the patient, and I've been the caregiver. And neither one are fun. But that's what we are dealing with. And hopefully after today, after our session, after your child session, a caregiving section, whatever section you're in, I hope something touches you. I hope something gives you hope. Because when we have that, we can move mountains. And that is what I feel like I did. I got my life back and I got my family back. And that is my hope and my prayer for you. So now I'm gonna to try to start my slideshow so I don't cry anymore. And we can talk about CRPS and a family and what that looks like and how you can make CRPS an addition to your family, but it by no means needs to take over your family. Okay, let's get started. Bringing up a family with CRPS. So you'll see at the bottom it says my name. I'm a marriage and family therapist. I'm a caregiver and I'm a CRPS survivor. And in the next slide, I'm gonna tell you all the other things that I am. And while I'm doing that, I want you all to think. I'm not just a caregiver. I'm not just a person with CRPS. I'm not just the daughter of someone with CRPS. I'm not just the father of someone with CRPS or the spouse. I want you to think of your other roles in the family. Maybe the roles that you were in charge of and your place in the family before CRPS entered because that's the healthy way to look at it. Don't look about at how you lost something. Let's integrate it. Let's add it into your family. Don't make it the outsider. Let's invite it in. It's here anyway. So let's invite it in and let's find a role for it in your family, a place but it doesn't get to take control. Okay, so a little bit about me, because if you're gonna have to listen to me for 40 minutes, you might as well know a little bit about me. <clears throat> There's my beautiful family, and I'm not gonna tell you whether or not the people in that family were sick or not sick, because there are other pictures you will see and you won't know either, and we look pretty darn good in all of them. And so you don't know when we're sick and we're not sick. And it's not because we're not in pain. And it's not because it's not hard. It's because we made a choice. And I'm not going to tell you that this was an easy choice. And I fought and I kicked and I screamed and I laid in bed and I hated the world. So I'm not going to tell you. I just got up one day and decided this is over. That's not it. I went through everything you went through. But we came out on the other side because we well, we had two. We had those two beautiful girls right there. So that's what we're going to talk about today, how to integrate CRPS and get the picture of the happy family that really is happy. So as I tell you about this, again, think about yourself. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I'm a sister, a daughter. I'm a friend. I was a teacher. I was a marriage and family therapist. I'm also a pet owner. I also like to cook. I'm a chauffeur because I have to take my kids everywhere. I'm a school volunteer. I tutor my kids when they need it. I'm a team mom in softball. And just like you, the list goes on and on and on and on. But for the purpose of our discussion today, I'm gonna to speak to you as a CRPS survivor and as a caregiver of someone with CRPS. And the reason I put that picture on there is because of this at the bottom. It's my promise to you. I'm going to assure you, it is entirely possible to raise a happy family with CRPS. Does not mean it's going to be easy. Does not mean it's every day is going to be fun and roses and tulips blooming, because it's not. But that doesn't mean you still can't be happy as a family and function as a family. And that's what we're going to do today, is we're going to figure out how to incorporate all those things. Okay, so I've already told you about myself, so we're going to skip down a little bit. Let's get to the part where I say, I'm the marriage and family therapist, and I specialize in blah, blah, blah. I taught school, 
currently the editor of the RSDSA community update. But here we get to the important part. But most importantly, my most important job I've ever had, my most important position I've ever held, is I'm a mom. And when I got sick, they were barely eight and 10. They needed me, just like a child always needs you, but they really needed me, they were little. So, as I said, they're the light of my life, they're my inspiration. So when I was diagnosed at 39, busy PTO mom, soccer mom, actually softball, my days were full to the day I, time I woke up to the time I went to, to bed exhausted, but they were happy full. And I was 39, I was planning my 40th birthday, let's go take my girlfriends to like a beach for the weekend, everything was great. And in two seconds that changed. I accidentally cut myself up with a kitchen knife right here, all the way down to the bone. And two weeks later, when the stitches came out and uh, the bandages came off, I was in the worst pain ever. And I told the doctor, I've never had stitches, so maybe this is the way it's supposed to feel? Is it supposed to hurt worse when they come out? He was like, no. So the short story is, one day I'm 39 and have this list of roles. The next day, two seconds later after cutting myself, I'm 39, I have all these roles, but I can't function. So who's gonna take over all this down here? I've still got all these responsibilities, but now I can't do anything, or I feel like I can't do anything. Who do you think took up the slack? My kids and my husband. And my husband took it all on. And he's over there in the corner, and I can't even look at him right now, because he took everything, all of it. Do you think that was hard for him? Not only was he the breadwinner anymore, now he's mommy, he's chauffeur, he's tutor, all the things I listed to you that I did, now daddy's that plus what he was doing. And the girls don't have mom anymore. But she's laying in bed and doesn't even want to pick her head up. So did, was that an adjustment in our family? You better believe it. And it stayed that way for a while. I'm not going to tell you the next day I got out of bed and decided this won't happen anymore because that's not what happened. It was a long, hard road, but it, it did get better. It got so much better. And that's the hope for you today. It might not be easy. It might be the hardest thing you've ever done, but you can make it better, and you can have hope. And this can go back up to this. It might not be this anymore, but you don't have to be down here. And all those problems and all those worries and all those roles are thrown at everybody else in your family. We can even it out. And that's what we're gonna work on today. So, I said, I was diagnosed at 39, my kids were eight and 10, and they still needed their mom. I knew that I had to find a way to continue to be their mom and a partner to my husband. So that's what we're gonna figure out how to do. Okay, this is a little spitfire. This is my youngest, this is Maddie. And the most important thing you need to know about her is she is tenacious and she loves softball. She lives for softball. So when she got hurt, she was kind of like me. She laid around for a while, and in fact, there were days she didn't go to school. One year, almost 48 days she missed school. But she still wanted to play softball. There were times when she had broke a broken collarbone where she actually sat at practice, because her dad was the coach, in a chair with the pillow in her brace, her little frozen peas on her collarbone, and she watched her team play. I said, you know what? She's like, I will not be taken out of this situation. This was something I chose. I chose softball. I will not give it up. You will not take it away from me. If it's sitting on the sidelines rooting my team on, then that's what I'm going to do. So as I said, you can get it back, your family. It might not look the same as it used to. It might look completely different. But you can have the happiness back, and you can make it work. So the only other thing I'm going to tell you about on this slide is I told you how tenacious Maddie was, how she didn't let anything stop her. So it's Maddie's determination and her little iron will that prompted me today to stand before you because I am terrified being up here. <laughs> 
our families are the most important, and let me say that again, our families are the most important defense that we have against this horrendous, awful, horrible disease. So if we don't keep them close and take care of our families, wow, then we really have a problem. You have to have them, you have to have love, you have to have support, and whatever your family is, it doesn't have to look like it. The one next door, or the one down the street, your best friend can be your mom for you. My sisters held me in my bed when my mom couldn't be there. My husband held my hand and would not never leave. Even though he knew there were people there that wanted to take care of me and friends and family that wanted, he still wouldn't leave my side, even for a couple hours. So you need to take care of your family. You have to take care of your family because they're taking care of you. So here we go. All right. Did you notice earlier when we were talking about roles that I mentioned CRPS, but I also mentioned all my other roles? And so that's how I want you to think about it from now on. Think of all of the roles in your family, include CRPS, but do not let it have the lights and the shininess and be out there in the front. Let it be like anything else. Let it have its role in your family. All right, so I'm here today to speak to you because, as I told you, I feel like I have a pretty unique viewpoint for you. I feel like I can cover and empathize with almost everybody in this room. If you're a mom or you're a dad and your child has CRPS, I've been there. I know what that feels like. I've sat in your chair. I've, I've sat in the office at the ortho for four and a half hours just to even get in, and then it takes two more hours. I know what that feels like, so I can talk to you as a caregiver. But I've seen this disease from both sides because I was a patient as well. So if you're a CRPS survivor, a warrior, a patient, whatever you want to classify it as, I've been in your shoes, and I've been in the pain you've been in. So I can speak to you as well, and I can empathize completely. I know what it feels like on both counts. I know what it feels like to watch the person you love, and I know what it feels like to be the person. So I feel like if I can talk to you today, and you understand that I've been on both sides of this, then maybe when you're sitting there, if you're sitting next to your son who has it, or your daughter, or your wife, or your husband, you just listen for you if you're the caregiver, and listen to me as the caregiver, and if you're the patient or the CRPS survivor, then you listen to me. And that's the way I, I would hope that this goes today. Listen to me from whatever perspective you're coming here today, because I hopefully can cover that for you. Here's another picture. And I'm not gonna tell you if I'm sick or if Maddie's sick. But I do, I will tell you this, there are pictures where she and I are both sick. And I can also tell you, you will not know. Because those fake, those smiles are not fake, they're real, because we were having a real moment that was happy. And those can happen as well. Again, hope, hold on to it. Okay, so before we can discuss how to function as a healthy family with CRPS, we need to think about our families. What are your roles? And just think through them in your head. Are you dad, breadwinner? Are you mom, breadwinner? Dad stays home, takes care of the kids. Are you a teacher? Are you a sister, a daughter, a caregiver? Think about your roles, but think about them right now before CRPS entered the picture. Do you have that visual? All right, now. Think about it once CRPS entered the picture. How did it affect your roles? Okay, I'm gonna speak as the mom who got sick. I told you the 50 million things I did every day. Do you think that changed my role? Yes. One day I did everything, the next day I was in bed and when my kids were hungry I heard them go find dad because I just couldn't get up to feed them. It changed the way our entire family functioned. They still f would come to me at first, but then I'm closing my eyes or I have sunglasses on because I had a migraine and 
the medicine, the new medicine they gave me made me so deathly ill and I lost 20 pounds in less than two weeks because I had no taste. My taste buds were gone. I get it. It changed our family. It changed my role. But speaking as the caregiver, I was back kind of in, getting into a little bit of a groove. I was feeling better and bam, my kid gets sick. I'm not just mom anymore again. Now I'm the caregiver. His dad needs to travel for work. And that's what he did before we all got sick. So dad needs to do that. He needs to be able to do that because he's the one taking care of our family financially. So now I have to figure out how to be a mom to Ashton, my older daughter. But I'm with Maddie all the time. Is that fair? Is that fair to the other daughter? No. So it had changed my roles both times. As I just mentioned it, chronic pain, it changes our roles, it changes our fi family dynamic, how we talk to each other, how we interact, and it particularly affects one sore subject, household tasks and chores. I'm sorry, that's just the truth. Nobody wants to take out the trash, but it needs to be done. And if I always fed the dogs and now I'm sick and I can't, well, somebody's got to feed the puppies. And somebody's got to get make sure Maddie's hair is braided because she was too young. She didn't know how to do it. So things don't go away and change. They have to still be functioning. They have to keep going on. So some of you might have fought that urge and tried to overdo things. You're like, I'm sick, but hey, I'm super mom. I'm super dad. I'm super daughter, super son. I'm going to be in pain, but I am going to, I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to push through. I'm not going to let these people in my life down. And you overdo it. Or you have the other problem, and they're both problems, mind you. Your family is so awesome and takes such wonderful care of you, like my amazing husband, who would put my clothes on for me so I wouldn't have to hurt my arm, who would cut my eggs and feed me. Now I'm the patient. I don't have any roles. I don't have any tasks or responsibilities. Okay, are either of those healthy options? Okay, I left a little blank right there. No, neither one of them are healthy options. But that's how we try to work through this situation when we get confronted with it. And we don't know what else to do. We're just trying to make it through a day with our family. So the important thing is to remember, maintaining a healthy balance of responsibilities is important for everyone in your family. Even the people dealing with CRPS, it's important that they have a role. No matter their age or how you feel, their capabilities. So, sharing household tasks. No matter how small the task is, at least if I could get up out of bed that day and say, I brushed Maddie's hair, or, I read to Ashton for about five minutes, or I signed Ashton's reading log, so her, we knew her homework was taken care of. I did my tasks that day. It might have been, been huge compared to the tasks I used to have before I was sick. Or when I was the caregiver, and I was trying to do everything to take care of Maddie, and I had to say, baby, you're going to go have to find Dad, because Ashton and I need to spend some time together, because she needs Mom, too. That was a task, and we had to figure those things out. So you're going to have to sit with your family and talk. What works for you? But do not just become the patient or the overdoing caregiver and take it all on or do nothing. Find a balance. If you're sick, find the one thing that you feel like you can do to help your family. How big, how small does not matter. It will make you feel good too. And they will know that you care. If you're the caregiver, don't do it all because you're going to burn out. Figure out what you can do for your family and do it. Help your kids help you. They can do it as well. Even when Maddie was sick, she'd lay on the couch for days, not feeling well. But at some point in the day, I would make her get up off of that couch, whether it was just to feed the dogs or if it was to go pick up her clothes off of the floor. She had to do something because she couldn't just lay around and be sick 24-7 because our house still had to function. So find a balance is the most important thing. And the only way you're going to find the balance and figure out the new way to create roles for everybody in this new situation is what? You have to communicate. You have to talk. And if you leave with nothing else here today, leave with that. Talk to one another, not just husband and wife, brother, sister, 
mom and dad, everybody. Whoever your family is, your best friend, your roommate, whoever it is that is your support network that you live with, you have to talk. And you might have to do it often. Because one week might be a bad week, but then you might have two good weeks. And you say, I think these two weeks, I can do this, this, and this. But if it doesn't work, say, it's OK. I'm going to have to scale back. But talk about it. Communicate. <clears throat> so a healthy family functioning requires what? We just said it. Communication. I'm sorry, at the end of the day, I might not be currently practicing at the moment, but I am a marriage and family therapist, so I'm going to tell you, you have to talk to one another. Communication. <clears throat> this is not that profound, you all know it. Chronic pain affects the entire family, right? Not just the person, not just the patient, not just the person in pain. Everyone in the entire family. The key to maintaining health and family functioning is that we recognize chronic pain's wide reach that affects everything and everyone around us. And we communicate that to each member of our family. I had to make sure there were days when I went up to Ashton, my older daughter, and said, I love you and I'm sorry the last three days I have done nothing but spend time with Maddie. Can you and I go lay down and watch a movie together? We had to communicate. I had to make sure she understood I realized her life changed and she didn't feel like she got as much attention from mom. It's important. You have to recognize how far chronic pain reaches out, where the ripple effect goes because it's huge, and stay in contact and talk about it. Has anybody ever heard of systems theory? And it doesn't just have to be related to therapy. It's related in science, math. So basically, what is it? A system is defined as the relationship between perceived individual parts to form a holistic entity. According to that definition, a family is a system. What happens to one part of the system affects what? The entire system. One person gets sick, the whole entire system gets sick. One person overdoes in the caregiving department and burns out and is exhausted, the whole entire system is affected by it. Just like the car, if we don't put gas in it, it will not work. And my husband's probably back there laughing because I never put gas in my car. <laughs> so. But I do understand that it's a system. <clears throat> so we're going to skim over these. So if we think of our family as a system, then we can go back to a, a therapeutic approach, a perspective called the family system perspective. And there are five core system principles that are helpful in understanding this perspective. The family is more than a collection of just random individuals. We know that. That is, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. We know that too. So you'd have to view your family as an entity all of its own and its own, its own life force, maybe. And knowing all of the members individually is not enough. One must understand that change or stress, like chronic pain, affects one member, but instead it's going to affect the whole entire family. If one person's in pain and under stress, it's going to affect the entire system. Families have repetitive interaction patterns that regulate each family member's behavior. These are the implicit rules for daily living. They may be almost ritualistic. We just know. Maddie and Ashton are supposed to feed the dogs every night at 5 o'clock. Mom's supposed to pick Maddie up from school on Mondays and take her to softball practice. Those are our rituals. There are patterns. So do you think they got changed when Maddie or I got sick? Sure. And as it says, those rituals aren't ever articulated. You just know. This is what mom does. This is what dad does. This is what sister does, grandma does. It's just what we do. That's why it's ritualistic. It just happens. So these patterns make family life completely predictable. You just know what's going to happen. Like everybody knows, Monday night is softball. <clears throat> and it makes easy, life easier when things are predictable. On a less benign level, the patterns may freeze or get stuck. 
in a particular way of behaving, making change difficult. So if you get frozen, if you get stuck, when Maddie got sick and I was going to ortho appointments and pain specialists and all of those appointments over and over again, we were kind of stuck in a perpetual pattern of we have to figure out how to take care of Ashton, dad has to do this, mom has to do this, but we just have to, we have to get Maddie into the doctor. And we were just stuck, we're frozen in that spot. And that was not healthy. We had to get out of that whirlwind cycle. We had to break the, the pattern because it wasn't effective. Another perspective would be individuals' system, symptoms may have a function within the family. For many reasons, a symptom may become incorporated into the family interaction pattern in such a way that it seems essential for the family's harmony and regularity. So, like I said earlier, it's like the symptom almost becomes a member of your family. I remember we would talk about it sometimes, and we'd just be talking about whatever was going on in life. At the dinner table, we kind of have a ritual that Brian and I'll ask the girls, well, what'd you do at school today? What was good? What did you enjoy? What did you not like? And that was, that was one of our rituals. But it almost became like CRPS became a member of the family because it was like, well, what was, what was your pain today? And we talked about it as if it was a, a person. And so we do have to incorporate it into our families. The ability to adapt to change is the hallmark of ham healthy family functioning. Change is ever present, we know that. Life is never the same. In addition, normal life cycle transitions, illness, may change a family's ability to adapt to new circumstances. With illness comes the reshuffling of roles, as we talked about. Everything's constantly changing. I can't do what I'm doing if I'm sick and dad has to do it now. Or if I'm taking care of Maddie as the caregiver, then he might need to take care of something for Ashton. The roles keep changing. The ability to handle these changes with flexibility, creativity, and determination reveals a great deal about family functioning. You don't have to do it the way everybody else does it. Be creative. Figure out what's working and do it. If it doesn't work, don't do it anymore. Try something else. Be creative. Think outside the box. This is an extremely important statement. There are no victims or victimizers in families. Family members share joint responsibility for their problems. Family members are both actors and we're reactors, especially in maintaining chronic problems like chronic pain. There are no family villains. Like a dance, family members move with one another in ways that lead to healthful or hurtful consequences. So we can do both. Family systems theory encourages one to look at the interconnectedness of our behavior and seed solutions in accordance with this viewpoint. So that was just something for you all to have. I'm sure it was boring and stuffy, but the little therapist in me just needed to do that for you. So sorry. <laughs> what are the implications for individuals with chronic pain in their family? Are there implications? Yes, unfortunately there are. We all know that. And do you like how slow it goes across? My daughter helped me with that. And she couldn't figure out how to get it doing that, so I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so what are the implications for individuals with chronic pain and on their families as well? The person with chronic pain is not the only person's life who changes, right? Right. Each member of the family must make adjustments, which may be psychological, social, emotional, and physical. Everything's going to change. Doesn't mean it has to be bad change, but it is going to change. Everyone involved will have thoughts and feelings about these changes, and it will be essential to remove barriers in order to freely discuss these issues. Honest, straightforward, and routine what? Communication is key to maintaining happy, healthy family functioning. Leave here with anything today. Talk to one another. Communicate. That's what I'm trying to get across, obviously, <laughs> as I say it over and over again. <clears throat> All right, chronic pain can create a system that is frozen or stalled. We talked about that a few minutes ago. So constant communication and system analysis is needed to ensure that the family is operating in a healthy manner. So all that basically means is, just like we get our cars checked up, go to the doctors for checkups, we have to constantly do checkups and analysis on our families. 
sit down every few weeks, say, is this working? I can tell you there are plenty of times when, we, like I was saying, we were frozen, did the same things over and over again, we just didn't know what else to do. But if we would talk as a family, you might have Ashton saying, I, I could help Maddie with her homework today, so mom, so you don't have to. Or maybe Brian could actually go play golf for an hour or two, and maybe one of my friends could come over. Let me be honest, that did not happen because he would not go, because he's just that awesome. But that doesn't mean it was healthy. See, learn from our mistakes. He had, the, he had the opportunity. He had a super sweet friend of mine that we loved whose husband was a doctor. And she'd tell him, go, go play golf with him for a couple of hours. Get away from here. And he wouldn't do it because he was worried about me and he loved me. And while the love and the compassion was amazing, that wasn't good for him. He didn't need to be around me 24-7, especially when I was at my worst. He needed a break. Your family needs a break. The caregiver needs a break. The person with CRPS needs a break. Your children need a break. So you have to constantly analyze, is this working? How we're functioning? Is it working? Is it healthy? Or do we need to change it because things have changed since last week? And it might not be monthly. You might need to do it every couple of days. Constantly ask, is this working? You have to communicate. So on the very last one, it says, once the reorganization of roles and the shift in power has occurred, there is this distinct tendency for this new order to be maintained. So just kind of like how I said we would get frozen. So just because you're doing the work and you're like, okay, we took her advice, we're talking, we're communicating, we're trying to fix things and analyze things, you can get frozen again and again and again and again. Because if you find something working for a little bit, it feels good and it feels comfortable. But it doesn't mean you don't need to reorganize yet again a few months down the road. Just like for us, when Maddie got sick, now I became the caregiver. Things were going along real swell. I was in remission. Brian was getting to work and not have to take care of everybody, and I was trying to go back into my role that I had had, and then Maddie got sick. Could we keep functioning the way we were? No. Now we had to figure out how to work around a child with CRPS, the child without CRPS, and make that family system work. So we had to reorganize. Okay, over time, a symptom may take on a life all its own. Oh, yes, it sure can. So what do we do about it? Well, the family needs to be aware that this is going to happen. It's going to occur and make a special effort to routinely assess family roles and tasks and make changes that will facilitate continued growth of the individual and the family unit. Like I just told you, you've got to reorganize, you've got to talk, you've got to ask if things are working, and if not, you have to change them. And by understanding and being aware that significant change is usually accompanied, like I told you before, by resistance, because it feels comfortable, so why fight it? difficulties may be anticipated and eventually overcome. So even though you're resistant to change, if you're aware that you're going to need to do it and you know you need to communicate and you need to talk about it, then it's going to be easier to anticipate the constant need for change and have actually work on it and do it. Be aware. Okay, these are my closing thoughts. No matter where you sit today, what position you're in, whether I spoke to you as a caregiver or if I spoke to you as someone with CRPS, a friend, family member, daughter, son. I want you to remember that the people sitting next to you that are here with you, the people that are in your household, people that hold your hand, the physical therapist that takes a special interest in you, the child psychologist that hugs and takes care of your daughter, and the school counselor at school that makes sure she's okay when you don't have her at home and she's away all day at school. Those people are your family as well. So don't leave here today thinking just the person, if it's your spouse or your best friend, that those are the only people that are in your family. Look out and, and see who is it you're surrounded by constantly? Who never leaves? That's your family. Take care of them. Nourish them. Tell them thank you. 
not just your caregiver. To the person that has CRPS sitting next to you, I appreciate you and I love you. Talk and talk and look in each other's eyes. Don't look above or below and talk to their heart. Because if you do communicate and you do talk, <clears throat> it will get better. And you will have those family moments that are happy. And as I told you, it might not look like the family you had before CRPS entered your life. But it can still be a really good family. Because I, I have a fantastic one. And I wouldn't be here today without them. So please take care of your families and say thank you. And I love you. Thank you all. And good luck.